Okay, everybody, we're going to welcome Ari Capotis to the stage. Please give her a hand, please. The presentation is titled Moving Beyond the Traditional Grip and Grin, as you can see from her title over there. What does that exactly mean? What are we going to talk about here? So what we're going to be talking about uh, today is just going to be taking more attractive photos, uh, especially if you're a catch and release angler. Um, it's important to keep in mind that uh, we need to pay attention to the fish's health and uh, we're not just out there for fishing for pictures. Um, <clears throat> if anybody has any questions, I'd appreciate it if you would save them uh, towards the end of this presentation. I don't intend to take the full hour, uh, so there's definitely going to be time for Q&A. All right, thank you very much. We're looking forward to hearing. Do you, need one, do you want to adjust the mic stand or do you just want to hold the mic? You can unclip it and hold it if you'd like. There we go. All right, All right great. Cool. Thank you, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. All right. So uh, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the sport fish of Steelhead Alley. So we're going to talk about steelhead, brown trout, and smallmouth bass. A little bit about myself before we get started. Uh, my name is Ari, and I'm actually a licensed fly fishing guide here in Pennsylvania. I typically stick to Steelhead Alley, but if anybody's interested in doing any other trips, please feel free to talk to me at the table uh, at the end of my presentation. Uh, within guiding, though, I would like everyone to know that I do think it's important to volunteer. Um, just like the, the poster said when it was uh, giving you a little bit of info about myself, I do think of myself as a conservationist, so I try to pay attention to uh, what I'm doing out there, but I also like to volunteer. Um, I volunteer with Trout Unlimited, and I also volunteer with the PA Steelhead Association. Uh, we'll talk about them in a few more slides. Fish handling, the responsibility of every angler. I know that a lot of people are very excited when they catch 30-inch steelhead trout. In the last couple years, I've seen fish beyond that length, especially since most of the anglers in Steelhead Alley claim to be catch and release. It's important that we pay attention to the way we're handling these fish. Okay, If we release them with the intent that we're going to be catching a 32-inch fish next year, we need to pay attention to how much time this fish spends out of the water exposed to the air. And we also need to consider uh, how we're taking these photographs. Now, the reason that I say a lot of the anglers in Steelhead Alley are catch and release is because I actually have some data to back that up. In 2021, there was a steelhead angler survey that was released by the PA Steelhead Association. They actually have a table here. I highly encourage you to go chat with them. Uh, but according to survey data just from last year alone, okay, uh, actually over three-fourths of the survey respondents said that they were practicing catch and release. Okay? Now, uh, before we get going, I just want to clarify a couple things. Okay? I'm not saying grip and grin pictures with your fish are bad. I'm not saying that you should keep all of the fish in the water and never have them out of the water when you're taking a picture. What I am saying is that better fish handling produces better quality photographs that appeal to anglers and non-anglers alike and increases the likelihood that fish will make multiple runs up the tributaries. There's a lot of different angles you can take when you're photographing your fish. And I don't know about you guys and gals, but sometimes I reel in and net a steelhead that is not all that attractive. Uh, so, you know, maybe not taking the grip and grin picture like that with a fish that maybe has a dead eye or their fins aren't looking too good or anything along those lines. You know, you can get creative when you're taking these photographs. You don't have to just post the same photos that you see other people taking out there. The survey. So the survey that I mentioned uh, where we ask if you're a catch and release angler, uh, over two thirds of them last year were. Really, I believe it was close to the 80th percentile, uh, but we need to dig into the data a little bit more about that. The Lake Erie Research Unit of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, those would be the guys to ask those questions from. Uh, there's, uh, they're right here in Fairview, and they, they're studying our fish on a yearly basis so that they can help make management decisions with the Fish and Boat Commission. Okay, so when you turn in these, 
these surveys to the Steelhead Association. At the close of the tributary season, that data gets turned in to the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Okay? Now, in order to access the survey, your best bet is to scan a QR code. Okay? There's uh, QR codes that are on these little pins at the Steelhead Association table, but you can also go to their Facebook page and their website. Now, when you fill out this survey, it does ask you what creek you're fishing. It's not in an effort to blow out your spot. The entire point is to give information to the gentlemen that make the decisions for the fishery. Now, on to best practices for catching and releasing fish, okay? Uh, now, as we can see on here, I point out that there's water dripping from the fish. I'm holding underneath the pectoral fins and supporting the fish, and then I'm holding in front of the tail. I'm also just barely above the water, so that if this fish was gonna flop on me, it's gonna go right in the water and not under the rocky shore and, and ding its head. Now with trout fishing in particular, okay, we're not going to be grabbing these fish like we might grab a smallmouth bass. Okay, it's very important that we're, when we're picking these trout up, uh, we're doing it pretty gently. Okay, if you pick them up and you try to really squeeze them, they're probably gonna flop even more on you, okay? In addition to all of this though, it is important that when you're fishing in the winter time, you don't have cloth gloves on. When that happens and you grab these fish and then you go to release them, when you look at your glove, you're gonna have a bunch of slime on it, okay? They're very slimy fish, trout in general are as well. The whole point of that slime coat is to protect them from pathogens, okay? So when you go to grab that fish with your winter gloves on, and it might have only just been out of the water for five or 10 seconds. That's not what we're worried about at this stage in the game. We're concerned with removing the slime coat from that fish. When I'm practicing catch and release, I always have a net with me. I think that it's important to net your fish because more often than not, you're not the only person on the creek. And when you go to beach your fish, uh, it, can, it can often be very hard on the fish and cause damage to it. Okay, so on here we have a fish diagram. Uh, the reason that I have this up here is because I just said we don't want to squeeze the fish under the pectoral fins. Take a look right on here where all of the major organs are. Okay, so here's the pectoral fin right there. When you're holding underneath and supporting it, then you're not gonna be putting additional pressure on important organs. When you squeeze the fish, you are gonna be putting pressure on their organs. Now you're not necessarily gonna be squeezing their heart because it's actually up a little bit further than you would think, but still, they're major organs, okay? So in addition to trying to pay attention and not having these fish bash their head on the rocks, it's also important that you don't squeeze them. It sounds like it's finally raining out there. Catch and release tactics have been studied. Um, it's something that's really more so on the forefront of fisheries management and studies. If you're interested in reading specifically about studies related to catch and release tactics for steelhead, or perhaps their ability to pass barriers uh, to migration, I highly recommend uh, taking a look at the Bulkley River studies. Uh, if you actually just search that, they'll come up pretty easily, but there's a website called Keep Fish Wet that I'm gonna talk about a little bit more uh, that has all of the studies related to catch and release posted right on there, okay? Now, the big highlight of this research and the reason that I'm bringing it up is because they actually wanted to specifically find out 
if the longer these fish are out of water, if you can really see that there's not only a behavioral difference, but perhaps it's increasing their mortality. Now, long story short, there's two factors with steelhead in particular we need to pay attention to. We need to watch how much they're exposed to the air, because these fish need to live in water. They're breathing in the water. And we also need to pay attention to water temperature, OK? So water temperature is extremely important for trout. Anything above 67 degrees is typically going to have less dissolved oxygen present. These trout really need dissolved oxygen. I was just on Elk Creek this morning, and I saw a couple floaters, and I didn't see any other damage to them. They just were dead fish, and I would argue that that was probably because of the water temperature when they were caught and released. Now, 67 degrees is the mark for me. Everybody can make their own decision on that, but the science is pretty clear. The closer you get to 70 degrees, the more likely you are that you're gonna be releasing a dead trout. Air exposure, 10 seconds or less. That is the benchmark. If you'd like to read a little bit more about where that comes from, I recommend that you go to keepfeshwet.org. And then there's also information on from takemefishing.org as well. Um, that's a very great website. Both of them do their best to just provide general information. They've got science to back it up. And what's wonderful about both of those organizations uh, is that if you sign on and contact them, uh, they'll more often than not send you some, some great uh, material and information that you can use to share with others. Uh, so if you were to come see me at my table or come see me after this, um, Keep Fish Wet actually sent me a be best practices card. I can present it to my clients when we're getting tied up and ready to go fishing for the day. And it'll just give them a, a general overview of exactly what we're talking about. They also sent me some stickers. Um, it's pretty great because it's got three bullet points of what I'm talking about. Minimize air exposure to 10 seconds or less. Eliminate contact with the dry surfaces and reduce handling time. Uh, they're nice waterproof stickers. They go great on one of your tackle or fly boxes. So how do we minimize air time but still take a nice photograph? The best way to do that is to prepare ahead of time, OK? Um, if you're fishing with a buddy, try to get your buddy to, to get down there when you're getting ready to net the fish. If it's a good buddy, they'll be down there anyway. But if they're like me, they might just be watching and still hoping they hook up. So uh, what you want to do, uh, you got your fish in the net, you're ready to take photographs, okay? You're going to prepare for the picture. You're going to gently grab this fish. Again, we're going to be supporting under the pectoral fins. We're grabbing in front of the tail fin. And it's a one, two, three lift. Snap a couple photos. And I usually am just releasing that fish right away. If it's a real stunner, it might go back in the net. And you might try to take another photo uh, again after a few more seconds. But the big thing when you're taking photographs, you have a net and there's a buddy there with the camera, communicate with one another. Pay attention to the frame of the photograph, OK? Nobody wants to have a picture of that beautiful steelhead and somebody cut off the top of your head. It's just not as attractive as if you were in the entire photograph. Another consideration when you're taking photos as well, you might want to pay attention to what's in the background of your photograph, you know? Um, it's, it's not always as sightly when you see that there's 10 or 12 anglers directly behind you, you know? Uh, so overall, when you're taking the photo, consider what you're trying to take a picture of and communicate with your partner. Keeping fish partially submerged during photos provides a pretty cool effect, and it's also keeping fish wet. So this is a brook trout. This is not going to be a steelhead alley game fish, but the reason that I put this photograph on here is because I felt that keeping the fish in the water kind of highlighted the, the spots on it a little bit better. Um, sometimes when you keep these fish in the water, you're going to get a little bit different, different color than when you pull it out. We're, we've got a couple more slides till we get to it, but you'll see what I'm talking about with some nice purple hues on a steelhead. When you pull it out of the water, it, it just kind of looks a little different. Okay, 
we're going to do a little photograph analysis so that I can kind of better explain what I'm talking about with paying attention to the health of the fish, but also taking prettier pictures. So the photo on the left is not the ideal, okay? There's a number of things wrong with it. First and foremost, uh, this fish is straight up on the ice. Uh, they don't have eyelids, so there's going to be snow buildup on that one eye of the steelhead. And overall, uh, it's just not that healthy for the slime coat of the fish. Um, it's a cold day out. You can see that there's snow. The other thing, too, is that it's just really not all that attractive when you compare it to the fish photo on the right. Okay, that steelhead on the right is still in the net. It's partially submerged. Uh, and overall, I feel like it's a, it's a better looking photo. I can tell you for a fact that the fish on the right was released and swam away. The fish on the left, I wasn't too keen on it being able to, to recover promptly and that fish went home and, and was on the smoker. Um, there's nothing wrong with taking your harvest of fish. We'll talk about that again in a few more slides. But if you are a catch and release angler, your goal is to catch and release fish healthily. Consider taking different angles of the fish. Uh, this is a golden red horse sucker. I know a lot of uh, people don't really enjoy catching them in the springtime. I think they're a riot. Because everybody catches and releases them, they're enormous. Uh, I, I think that they're just an overall cool looking fish. Um, I wanted to make sure that I could highlight how golden it is on the left hand side. And I, I think that their lips look pretty ridiculous. So that's what I decided to take a photograph of there. This is a traditional grip and grin photograph, okay? You're holding the fish, you're looking right at the camera. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this, except for the fact that this fish clearly isn't wet, okay? And, you know, you can tell I'm on a boat, so it's definitely gonna be taken home here, but you need to pay attention to the way that you're holding these fish. I can't believe how many times I see pictures and their fingers are right in the gills, okay? When you have your fingers in the gills, you're doing damage to an important body function of the steelhead. They need their gills in order to absorb dissolved oxygen and to continue to live, okay? Uh, we wanna make sure that we never, ever, ever have our fingers in the gills. If you caught a beautiful fish, most of the anglers that you hang out with would actually rather see the fish, okay? I know that sometimes I make a little bit of a goofy face if I'm particularly excited about my catch. So I usually try to just take photographs of the fish. Uh, this is a smallmouth bass I caught when I was actually chasing suckers in the springtime, and it was a heck of a fight. Uh, so did my best to keep the fish wet, and he went right back after this photograph. This is, a, this is what I'm talking about when I say we're moving beyond the grip and grin, okay? I'm still grinning. I'm still gripping the fish, but it's partially submerged. So if she goes to thrash on me at all, or I lose control of the fish, fish whatsoever, not a big deal. She's going to swim right back into the run that I hooked and played her out of. Food for thought. If it's so cold outside that you have ice buildup in your rod guides and you've got ice buildup on your waders, do you really want to pull that fish all the way out of the water and the gills in the mouth are opening up because it's out of breath, it just got done fighting you, and you're going to be exposing those, those soft tissues directly to freezing cold air. Uh, it's just something that I'd like folks to consider. I'm still breaking ice out of my rod guides in January and February out there fishing. I have a real addiction for steelhead, but when I'm hooking and playing and landing those fish in the dead of the winter and the water temperature is so cold that, that some folks might tell you that they're not really eating, I don't even remove those fish from the water, okay? I'm always fishing with a net. I'm gonna be netting that fish. I'm gonna remove my fly. I might snap a couple pictures while it's still basically in the water, but. It's not coming out of the water for a photo. This is the picture that I was actually talking about that keeping the fish in the water can kind of, uh, can kind of highlight some different colors than you would otherwise see. Uh, I think that the water really did, did well with highlighting how beautiful this steelhead is. 
Uh, obviously, if I pulled it out of the water, it would have still been a beautiful purple hue to it, but there's just something about it keeping it in the water. Show of hands, how many people here are actively steelhead fishing every year? Okay, awesome. And, and uh, show of hands, do you take a picture of most of the fish that you're catching when you go steelhead fishing? All right, we got some dedicated anglers in here. Wonderful. Um, I like taking photos. Um, I don't know that I could say I take photos of every fish that I catch, but uh, I, I really try to, to pay attention to the way I'm taking my pictures. Um, my family, they all fish, but we grew up perch fishing, so they think I'm a little loony chasing steelhead all the time. And when I try to show them pictures of my catch, I usually try to keep it interesting. Um, I want it to be a cool picture. I want it to highlight why I think these fish look so beautiful. And I try to keep it simple because they're not crazy steelhead angler like I am. So I also like to take catch and release videos. What's nice is that the catch and release videos look really slick and you're keeping the fish wet the whole time. It's really minimizing your fish handling overall. Did you see how pink my hands were? Oop, let me go back. My hands are super duper pink because it was pretty darn cold that day. That was a major reason why I tried to keep this fish wet and in the water, okay? Um, I don't handle fish with gloves because I know that it's removing the slime coat. There are some folks out there that use nitrile gloves. Those are perfectly fine too. Um, it's just something to keep in mind. If you'd like to read a little bit more about removing the slime coat, again, I recommend going to keep fish wet, but there's a lot of information out there that even from the Penn, Penn State University where they're studying brook trout. Keepfishwet.org is a nonprofit organization dedicated to bridging the gaps between science, recreational angling, and best practices for catch and release angling. I highly recommend visiting their website. Resources from the Fish and Boat Commission. There are quite a lot. It's a pretty big website. Uh, I'm always a little bit surprised that more people don't visit it though. Uh, there's tons of information on there, not only about best practices, what's legal and what's not, uh, but it's also gonna be giving you public access information. Okay, there's a GIS map uh, that's available on the Fish and Boat Commission website, you can know for sure if you can go fishing there. And it can show you new spots all over the county, okay? All of the streams that we have steelhead runs up, the Fish and Boat Commission does their best to make sure that we have public access. My talk has focused mainly on catch and release tactics. That's what I'm all about, okay? But if we're being very realistic, the steelhead fishery especially in Pennsylvania, is designed as a put, grow, take. Within that though, the Fish and Boat Commission does encourage anglers to release some of their catch. They call it being a smart angler, okay? Uh, it's a great little acronym. Safety first, manners are important, appreciate clean water, release some of your catch, and teach others to be smart anglers. The other thing to consider within all of this, even though it's completely legal for you to take three steelhead per day, as long as they're over 15 inches in length, does anybody here know how long the state record steelhead was for Pennsylvania? 36 and a half inches. It's a big fish. I don't think that was a three-year-old steelhead. In 2001, it was measured at 36 and a half inches and it weighed 20 pounds, three ounces. Uh, that was caught at the Walnut Creek access area. That fish was absolutely m more than a few years old. Eight years is a pretty long time for a steelhead. Okay, we know that they can make multiple runs up the tributary. Uh, if, if we do our best to use the proper tactics and handling when we're playing these fish and releasing them, it's very possible that the state record could be beaten 
any time. I know that I've seen a lot bigger steelhead the last few years. Uh, I think it's because catch and release is really catching on. But don't take 5,000 photographs with the fish out of the water. If you're a catch and release angler in the state of Pennsylvania, you have a legal requirement to release them immediately unharmed into the waters with which they were taken, okay? A fish caught that is not to be counted in the creel limit shall be immediately released unharmed into the water from which it was taken. A fish that is injured or is bleeding as a result of being caught will not be considered unharmed and will be considered as part of the daily creel or possession limits. The exception here is if you're in some sort of fishing derby or anything along those lines. Uh, <clears throat> again, I just want to focus that if the fish is injured or bleeding or it's very apparently floating, that fish needs to count towards your creel limit for the day. Okay, you have a legal requirement to pay attention to the health of the fish. Does this mean that you should police the local waterways? No, it does not, okay? This means that you're on notice to responsibly practice catch and release handling. And overall, it's just out here having fun, right? It's mostly what the catch and release anglers are out there for is recreation. So have fun with it. It doesn't need to be overly serious. I usually tell people all the time to relax. It's just fishing. Thank you for your time. I just want to highlight that I think it's very important to keep fish wet. Take different pictures than you normally see, uh, especially with the, the iPhones that we have these days. Uh, whether you have an iPhone or an Android, there's all kinds of things that you can do when you go to take photographs. Um, especially, I know for my iPhone, there's uh, portrait mode, which is going to be a little bit more focused and, and more detail on people specifically. I've got slow-mo video, regular video, you can take panoramic, there's all kinds of stuff you can do with your phone, and there's self-timers. I recommend pulling up a YouTube video specific to your device so that you can learn how to use the self-timer for taking photographs, but I mean, it, it's pretty handy, you know? You can wedge your, wedge your phone into a tree or a rock, and you can set it for five or 10 seconds, and that'll, it'll go off for you. The other thing too, uh, with I know with my iPhone in particular, uh, it's nice that you can adjust the way that the exposure works and I can also adjust some other aspects that you'd think that you'd need a professional camera for, but you can really just use your phone for it. So I encourage you to toy with your phone. Make sure that you're handy with taking pictures before you go to take your first picture of a fish. Um, you usually are a little bit more pumped up than you realize when you go to take those pictures. So thank you for your time, everybody. I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. <laughs> I recommend going on the Fish and Boat Commission website and taking a look at the steelhead trout waters. You'll be pleasantly surprised that there's more spots available than you were aware of. Yes. I have a mid-length boat net uh, from Fish Pond. Uh, it, I, did, I did have to dish out for it. Uh, but I like it because it's a super wide hoop. Um, some, some people think it's a little wider than I need. Maybe, but I'm not the tallest of people, so I like to have the extra reach. So it's a long-handled mid-length boat net. Fish USA actually has a, a really great net that they just released. Um, it's very comparable to the fish pond net I'm telling you about, but uh, it's a little bit smaller, so it'd be easier for you to get in and out of brushy areas with. But I'd recommend talking to the Fish USA guys about uh, their silicone net that they just released. I highly recommend using silicone, but I mean, I, I grew up on the lake, so I have ranger nets and all that good stuff too. Um, I, if, if you're dealing with trout, I recommend having a, a silicone net or something that's, that's pretty soft. When I deliberately fish for suckers, I'm actually <laughs> using uh, sucker spawn. Usually I go for an orange sucker spawn or something that, that looks just like 
with their with their laying down. Uh, that's how I caught that smallmouth. Actually, I was drifting for suckers with that. Uh, it's a uh, basically a crystal meth egg, basically, you know. Uh, but if I'm really like I need to catch a sucker, I really want to catch one. I'm probably gonna actually put on a streamer, believe it or not. Yeah, I'll put on a double bunny streamer and they smash it. It's crazy. I'll usually go out there with an eight weight and you're, <laughs> they're gonna rip line from you. It's kind of surprising. I think they're a lot of fun, but just fish like you're fishing for trout. Um, usually I'll go for the fast water and I'll put a double bunny through there and they snatch it, which is crazy because they're a bottom feeder with their lips, but yeah. Well, thanks everybody, I appreciate it. <laughs>